screen. So I will continue with the presentation in that case, and I will explain you what happens in the video. So Burger King is here advertising they are selling a Whopper, and it seems to be bigger than it is in reality. So what is most important about the claim, because it's a claim for millions, um, is that as a natural person, you must think as well, like what you can expect. So for example, if you buy a product in a restaurant, you buy a pizza, uh, it should look like the pictures on the menu, for example. But if it's like a fast food center, you cannot expect all the food to be exactly the same as on the picture in the menu. So what the court will do, if you will start a claim against a company such as Burger King, because the food product does not look the exact same size or the exact same as the picture, um, they will check and verify if it's reasonable to expect the same uh, in reality as on the picture. So even if it's a bit different than on the picture, it doesn't mean you have the right to say it's falsely claimed yet. I shared with you the link uh, in the chat so you can watch it later but you can also um, check it again in the PDF file. It's in the presentation, so you can still review it later on. So we will continue now with the most important things you can see in advertisements and the negative effects, but also some positive effects, of course. Because why are advertisements so important in our daily life? Well, first of all, they inform you, of course, about the products. They make you aware of new products on the marketplace and they make you aware of the benefits of a product. So, for example, if you are willing to buy a new medicine, maybe you will uh, have seen an advertisement in a newspaper or maybe on the news channel and that's going to make you buy the product. So advertisements are a key role in making a decision to buy a product or a service from a company. And they also greatly influence our purchasing decisions. But that does mean they have to be accurate. So they cannot be an accurate misleading or exaggerated. And an illustration should match the services in a reasonable way. Um, also, what we see very often, unfortunately, is that products, they contain a false list of ingredients. So, for example, if you buy a orange juice and it says it's uh, processed, it might not contain all the ingredients on the ingredient list. Or it can contain harmful substances to make sure the product will last for a longer period. Or perhaps, for example, with um, hair products, uh, if you are looking for a hair product and you want to have more hair so it grows faster, sometimes the results of the products are falsely claimed. So especially these type of claims, they are on their supervision and they need to get extra approval. You cannot just sell a product and claim health benefits. If it's related to medicine or cosmetics, uh, you need to be more aware. Or for example, an advertisement may not include all the fees they promote. For example, if you're gonna pay $5,000, we will find you a job in the first four to eight weeks. You can find a remote job and you can earn an income of 10K a month. But then once you started the contract they are forcing you to make more payments or they will charge your credit card for more additional charges these things also happen in reality or for example think about a festival or maybe a concert they try to sell more tickets and then they say all the tickets are almost sold out so you have to buy the tickets now faster or the uh, early tickets are sold out these type of claims must be verifiable and they should be based on true facts. So they do not influence your decision in a negative way. So these are very common and very important examples. And I'm sure we can think of many more. Uh, so I'm curious to hear your thoughts in a bit as well. So false advertising is a, uh, it forms a critical issue in the world of marketing and business. And it refers to the act of making a false or misleading claim about a product or service in order to, de to deceive you as a consumer. And it's very dishonest, of course, but it's also unfair to you as a consumer, but also for a competitor, because it means the competition is going to be more unfair and it makes you to um, make a choice based upon false information or maybe spend money 
on something that doesn't live up to the hype. Some people, they even get into uh, debt collection issues because they sign a contract based upon false and misleading information. So what do the authorities do to protect you as a consumer? We have the government and we have consumer protection agencies to create rules and regulations to prevent false advertising. And we can also hold companies accountable for their claims. So it means we are more able to trust, uh, hopefully, because there are legal consequences and you can actually sue a company if they are falsely advertising. And you can also report the false and misleading claims to the consumer protection agency in your own jurisdiction, so in your own country. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts, like what you can also do about it as a consumer. Do you have any ideas what you can do to prevent making a wrong decision? So before you're going to make the decision to purchase a product or a service, what things could you maybe check to make sure you are less likely to get involved in these type of practices? Can you share in the chat your thoughts? If you have any. So Lillian, can you, you raise your hands? Um, can you share your thoughts with us, please? I think you are on mute. I asked you to unmute. I'm not sure. So Jennifer is saying in the chat, uh, you always seek a second opinion. That is a very important aspect. So how would you ask a second opinion from a product substitute? Anybody else has any ID? Lillian, I can still see your hand is up, but I do not know how you can unmute yourself. So maybe you can share your thoughts in the chat here. Yeah, it seems like Lillian is unmuting herself. She can write the comment in the chat instead, and you can go ahead, Lynette, Oh, okay. Um, so here we have another answer. So uh, another participant is saying to advise whether the monitoring agencies have a way of ensuring products to conform to the safety requirements before production of the products, especially for food and hair products. Yes, that's true. Uh, there is a way, especially if it's related to medical claims, there has to be a certain type of um, that there must have been some proof before they can actually claim such a statement and it's also regulated. Uh, so we shall continue for now. And if you have any more ideas, please feel free to share them. So the first thing, of course, you can do is uh, very straightforward. As a consumer, you can read the label of the product before you're going to buy it. You can check the reviews online. But you can also check if there's been any charges against the company or regarding the product or maybe about the conditions before you're going to make the purchase. And also it's important to know and understand that you as a consumer, you have rights. And that means you have the right to accurate and detailed information. And you can actually also demand more detailed information from the businesses. So, for example, if there is a company advertising a program for you to enroll in, so you have a better chance to find a career, for example, or maybe uh, to fight against a disease, you have the right to um, receive more detailed information about the program and you can actually demand more information from the company as well. So, you as a consumer, you have rights 
but the business also has responsibilities. The business should also provide a description that does not mislead you as a consumer. This is actually regulated and required by law. So they should also correct false information or a misunderstanding and provide proper compensation to a consumer if needed because it's required and mandatory uh, by law. So we have one more comment and that's one can check the ingredients and ask Uncle Google about the ingredients just to be safe. Yeah, that's true. That's definitely something you can check and do by yourself. Uh, another idea is also if you want to check the ingredients, check them per ingredient and also check them uh, related to official health websites. So not just only consumer reviews based upon personal experience, but also regulate, regulated by health agencies. So do you have any other ideas? What else can consumers do? What else can you do if you get involved in such a practice to defend your rights? Does anyone of you ever experience anything with a false advertisement or a false claim of a company or maybe a scammer? Because we see that nowadays quite often as well. People who are tricking you to pay a certain amount of money and then they keep asking for more and more money or they falsely claim certain health benefits and they actually do not occur. I still don't see any hands, so we shall continue. So if businesses have um, informed you falsely and they make false claims, you can actually report this to the consumer protection agency in your country or the relevant authorities. And what can they do? They actually have quite a lot of power. They are able to ask the company to take down or amend the advertisement. And they can also sanction the businesses if necessary. So for example, if a company is claiming you will have health benefits and you will be uh, looking 10 years younger in the next 30 days by only eating a certain type of vitamin, which is not true and it's not proven, you can actually go to the uh, consumer protection agency and they will reach out to the company and they can ask and demand to take the advertisement down. So completely out of the air. And they can also impose a fine to the company. And the fines, guys, they can be really hefty. The fines can add up to millions. We're not talking about 5 millions here, but it can even exceed like 45 million. So the amounts are very high in this industry. And why are they this high? To ensure the sanctions are taken seriously and to protect the consumer market and fair competition. So they are here for legal compliance and also to maintain trust and transparency in the marketplace. And I think this is very crucial for you to understand and also to be aware of, especially because our world is becoming more and more digitalized. So it's, um, you see more advertisements online and you're not maybe able to review the product in person. So maybe you are more likely to buy a product faster and maybe you did not do enough research or maybe you don't know the product because many new products, they enter the market uh, lately. So it's very important to be legally compliant and to know your rights as a consumer as well and what you can do about it and how you can start with any background research as well. So here is a historical overview of the regulation evolution. So here you can see the years and then here you can see the acts which were enforced and here you can see the impact. Are you aware or familiar with any of these acts? These acts refer to the states, but maybe uh, one of you has done any research about the packaging or labeling, or maybe one of you has a Dropshipping company. Has any one of you ever checked the rules or regulations about the advertising or maybe tobacco industry?
So I do not see any hands raising yet, but I will guide you through one of the most important ones over the past century. So here we can see that the first federal law um, became in force to regulate the food and drugs industry. And especially the food and drugs industry are, of course, very important. And later on, uh, they introduced to prevent unfair methods of competition and deceptive acts or practices in commerce. And why is competition a very important aspect? Does anyone have any idea? Is there any advantage about competition in the marketplace? So I can see the hands of you, Herbert. I can ask you to unmute so maybe we can hear your thoughts. Uh, thank you. I think what I will say about uh, competition is that competition in market helps a lot because uh, it can uh, help the consumer be, be able to make choice and that choices may affect the prices which can assist the consumer in, in, in some way. Correct. And also allow the, a window for others to come in into the business. Yes, that is very true. It actually helps the consumer to make a decision because they are able to compare the product to other products and they can check the benefits or maybe the results. And they are more informed as well because competition is actually existing. So it's a very important aspect. Without competition, we would be much more uh, single oriented. So it's actually very important. We allow competition and that's why fair competition is secured. So I can see one more hand. Uh, Lillian, can you maybe unmute yourself so we can hear you? So I still think there is a problem with the mute button here. So I think we continue if, or if anyone else still has something to add here? Okay, well, Herbert, thank you very much for uh, thinking along with us and for answering the question. You're very right. So what happened afterwards uh, in the States, basically they were thinking about creating an authority to regulate false advertising claims and also regarding the cosmetic and therapeutic devices as well. So for example, if you use a device against sore muscle pain, and you are claiming it will help you to relieve the pain. These results must also be proven. You cannot just create a cosmetic or therapeutic device to help your body heal from certain pains or um, issues you are facing without any proof or any evidence to back it actually up. And later on, they also created laws and acts about the labeling and packaging information. So the labels should. Um, they should include the ingredients that are actually in the package or in the product. And later on, of course, this was followed by the cigarettes uh, industry. And that means you must be informed about the risks of smoking. Now, what we can see after the tobacco industry, the vape, of course, came very popular amongst youngsters. And the vape, for example, is advertised as a smoking candy bar. That's how the youngsters unfortunately uh, view the vape because the vape looks like a very hot item in different colors. And then it tastes like candy, like watermelon or bubble gum or whatever you can think of. You can um, taste a bit of the candy when you smoke it and you don't have the annoying smell of cigarettes anymore on your hands or in your hair. So what they are now thinking of, for example, to prevent the vape of becoming too popular and inform you as well about the risks of smoking for your lungs. They are thinking about to prohibit smoking devices which are not tasting like tobacco in the Netherlands. 
So what is the consequence of this, that if you will smoke the vape, that the vape may only be, for example, uh, on the market when it's actually tasting like tobacco. It's not enforced yet, but I think it's uh, it could be very beneficial because if you smoke a vape and you don't taste anything of tobacco, it's, of course, very attractive to smoke a vape because you don't taste any of the negative consequences. And it's much more attractive for youngsters as well. And it's still a very addictive device. So later on, what happened as well is um, more amendments they were occurring and also about the truthfulness and accuracy was more regulated. The children's advertising review unit came into force. Uh, also regulation about the commercial email and then the green guides. So for example, the greenwashing, if you are stating you are a very... Uh, you have a very sustainable product, but it's not that sustainable at all in reality, then you are actually deceptive because you are falsely claiming greenwashing statements, which is also very well regulated. So these are all different acts. You can maybe later on check yourself if you're interested. For now, we will continue on the false advertising itself and we will discuss a few examples as well. So you have a better understanding. So there are different types of false advertising. The types we're going to discuss today are the deceptive practices, the misleading claims, and the comparative advertising. You can see this occur on a daily basis as well. So what does deceptive mean? Deceptive bas basically means that it involves the intention of misleading you as a consumer through false or misleading information. So like we discussed earlier today, like false claims or hidden fees or bait and switch tactics. So a misleading claim involves making false or exaggerated statements. For example, if you will enroll in this program, you will, you'll be able to quit your full-time job and you will find a, a new career with a 10K income in the next two weeks. If I will create such a program and I will advertise it in this way, I'm not actually informing you about the uh, maybe the amount of effort you are quite likely to actually input before you will find a job. So I am misleading you because I didn't inform you about the full information details when I am selling my program. Another example is comparative advertising. This is a very important one. So for example, if I will compare my product to your product and I will have the intention of making my product appear superior based upon false statements, I am subject to comparative advertising, which is also prohibited. However, false or misleading comparisons can also be considered false advertising when it includes false claims. So for example, if I will include reviews that are not existing or maybe I will uh, talk very negative about your product which is not true at all then I am false advertising for creating a com uh, comparison between your and my product is that clear to you or do you still have questions about these three types we will dive into it a bit deeper Sorry, Lynette, and some students are asking you to slide to the slide you are talking about. Sorry? I am talking about this slide. Can you see it? No, the slides, the slides are not moving. Oh, that is weird. Let me... Can you see the screen now? Because it is showing on my screen. Maybe I need to share another screen with you. No, the, the screen the screen is sharing the, the slides, but they don't are aren't moving. Can you see it now maybe the types of false advertising?
I don't know why it's not moving. Can you can you tell me which screen you see right now? We I see the first slide, that which is page one of your PDF file. Page one only. Oh, that's that's annoying. Yes. Uh, you know what? I'm going to try it again because. But I think then I have to leave the meeting and come go back in again, or maybe you can share the screen on Sunela. I don't know why. Okay, let me share the screen myself. We are now on sheet number 12. Yeah, so now we discuss the three different types of false advertising. You will all receive this PDF file after the presentation, so you can still uh, review the information. I'm sorry for the inconvenience that you couldn't see the sheets. So maybe Antonella, if you can go to the next sheet, please. Yeah. So the legal framework, like we discussed earlier today, there are different national authorities responsible for regulating and for enforcing consumer protection laws. So um, I think you are all from different countries, but you can check with the government, which is the authority in your country uh, who is regulating the consumer protection laws. So for example, in Europe, we have different member states and we have a European directive and if you will click on the link in here in the PDF file later on, then you can check the European Directive for unfair commercial practices. And there are a lot of different rules in the European Directive that apply to all the member states in the European Union. So all the member states, they had to create law to make sure they are compliant with the European law. And per member state, we have different national authorities who will regulate the consumer protection laws. So for example, in the USA, because the USA is one big country with different states, uh, there is the Federal Trade Commission and they have guidelines. And the FTC is re responsible for regulating and enforcing consumer protection laws. And the purpose of consumer protection laws are to protect you as a consumer from false and deceptive advertising. Because without consumer protection laws, we are uh, most likely more exposed to false advertising by competitors or maybe any company that's trying to sell a product because they want to increase their revenue. So because of the consumer protection laws, we are more protected and we are more able to uh, have a transparent consumer marketplace as well. So these are very important items. And also, if you are a victim of a scamming case, then you know where to go to and you know uh, how to enforce your consumer rights as well. So Antonella, can we go to the next sheet, please? So now we will discuss um, a few aspects of advertisements. So if you will create an advertisement, what is a accurate advertisement? So first of all, an advertisement, if you will create an advertisement for your product, it must be truthful and it must be non-deceptive. And also you must have evidence to back up your claim and they cannot be unfair. So these are very important aspects for you to take into consideration. And also additional laws apply for specialized products like consumer leases or credits uh, or telephone sales. So for specific items, there are additional laws applying to make sure these topics are more regulated because it could be a bigger loss if you are involved in one of these type of industries. And in the States, every state has consumer protection laws that govern ads running in that state. So that is very important to be aware of. Uh, Antonella, can we go to the next sheet? 
Okay, so the first aspect we were just talking about is what makes an advertisement deceptive. So according to the FTC in the States, when it's deceptive, it means that a statement contains or omits information. So what does that mean? That it either contains or it leaves out specific information. And because of this, you are likely to be uh, misled and you are buying a product which you otherwise would not have bought. And it's very important to think of what can reasonably be expected from a consumer. So they will check if it's likely to mislead a consumer, acting reasonably under the circumstances and if it's material. So that means if it's important uh, in the decision to buy or to use the product. So we can go to the next sheet, please. So there are different enforcement mechanisms according to the law. Uh, so first of all, enforcing laws are important because without enforcement, there is no consequences if you are not compliant, of course. And they are also in place to penalize companies engaged in deceptive practices. So for example, the regulatory authorities such as the FTC, they play a key role in enforcing false advertising claims. I think there is one comment here. Oh, I cannot see it anymore. Um, so yeah, the regulatory authorities, they play an important role because they have the authority to investigate the complaints, but they can also conduct an audit and they can issue a penalty or a fine for, for violations. So what does the penalty and fine mean? So companies found guilty of false advertising, they may face financial penalties and fines. And the amount of penalties can vary depending on the severity of the violation and the jurisdiction in which the offense occurred. But even more important, maybe, is the civil and criminal liability. In addition to the regulatory enforcement, uh, you as an individual and a competitor can also take legal action against the company for false advertising through civil lawsuits. So this allows you to seek compensation for damages resulting from deceptive practices. And also, you may be subject to a criminal uh, sanction because of false advertising criminal charges may be filed against the person or the company who is responsible for the false advertising and criminal penalties can include fines but they can also include imprisonment or maybe even both so that is very important to be aware of that the legal consequences can be very severe so now we can continue to the next sheet So what makes a, an advertisement unfair? So uh, unfair means for an advertisement that it's likely to cause substantial consumer injury, which a consumer could not reasonably avoid. And it's not outweighed by the benefits to the consumer. So unfair means um, you were not very likely to make the decision in an other way because it could not be reasonably expected from you. That's according to the FTC. So that's when an ad or a business practice uh, is deemed to be unfair. So we can continue to the next sheet. So in recent years, there have been different cases uh, and they are very important because they also create a lesson for brands, but also for consumers, and they highlight the potential consequences. So there are a few lessons we can extract from these type of practices. So the first one is consumer trust. Uh, one of the consequences, for example, if a company is sued by a consumer because they are involved in false advertisements, they are more likely to lose consumer trust which can decline in a very big loss in sales and maybe even long-term damage to the brand's reputation. And other consequences are, of course, the legal consequences. So there are two cases we will discuss today. The first one is the one of Samsung. I'm sure you know the brand called Samsung and they sell mobile phones. 
in 2019 they were sued and they uh, got a penalty of 14 million because they claimed their mobile phones were very, very water resistant. And then this was proven to be wrong. It was falsely claimed. And they were sanctioned to pay 14 million, which is quite a high amount. Another example is the Danone Activia brands, and they were claiming health benefits from the yogurts. And the health benefits were uh, unfortunately not proven. So there was not enough evidence to prove the facts and the claims they were stating to sell the products. They reached a settlement of 45 million. Another lesson we can extract from here is brand reputation. So for example, if you will um, be subject to a legal case, your brand reputation will of course be less beneficial. So you can lose customers uh, because it's very challenging and you need to prioritize honesty and transparency. So we can continue to the next sheet, please. So here are a few different steps. Uh, the FTC follows to check if an advertisement is deceptive. And like we discussed, the first one you should think of is from the point of view of the reasonable consumer. So the typical person looking at the advertisement. So if you are checking an advertisement, we do not need to think of you as the experts in the cosmetic industry when buying a cosmetic product. We should expect you to have the reasonable consumer knowledge. So for example, if a regular person is looking at an advertisement, are they um, influenced by the product's details and the product statements or the words, the phrases and pictures to determine what it conveys to consumers? And the FTC, they look at express, but also implied claims. And an express claim is literally made in the advertisement. So for example, when I say this product will prevent the cold, it is very directly claimed. So if you buy this product, it will prevent the cold from happening. So that means it is literally made in the advertisement. An implied claim is one made indirectly. So for example, the mouthwatch uh, kills the germs that cause the colds. That means that it will prevent the colds. So I'm not saying it will directly prevent the cold, but I'm saying um, it indirectly. So you are more likely to buy the product because of the indirect claim here. So here you can find the explanation a bit more detailed if you later want to review it. And then now we can continue to the next sheet. And we are almost coming to the end where we will check an example. And then I want to hear your thoughts of the example illustration to check if you maybe have ideas about the advertisement. So these are important aspects to understand and to look at an advertisement. So for example, if you look at an advertisement, it's also important to check what it does not say. So for example, maybe the advertisement is leaving out information to uh, create a misimpression of the product. So for example, if a company is advertising a collection of books, then maybe, and it could be deceptive if the advertisement is not the closing, that consumers actually would receive a shortened version of the book. So I am selling to you a collection of the book, whereas in reality, I'm selling you a very short version per book in a bundled collection. Another uh, example is for uh, the claim to be material. So that is important for a consumer to buy or use the product. So examples of material claims are representations about a product's performance. For example, a bike, which will make you go 20 times as fast or specific features or the safety of a helmet, for example, or the price. For example, you will get a bonus price and then the price is adjusted to be twice as high or maybe it will be not as effective as we are claiming the product is in reality. So it's very important to have sufficient evidence in practice to support your claims in the advertisement. And this is mandatory by law. So you have to have the proof before the ad is actually running. So you will now continue to the next sheet. 
So we are now at the end of the presentation and now I want to discuss with you today a advertisement and there are six problems with this advertisement which are misleading. So I would like to hear your thoughts about number one till six and maybe you can tell me uh, what is wrong or maybe what could be improved here. So here we have uh, one participant saying that the consumer protection laws should be working like quality control for agencies, for example, of the products before consumers to find out the false advertising process. Yes, that is true. And also that we can now pay for the damages that the product had caused to the life of average consumers who may have no easy link to the law because of their less privilege. That is true, but everyone uh, is able to reach out to the national authorities and they can protect you and reach out to the company on your behalf. And the company will be liable for the damages incurred if they are uh, accused of falsely advertising and if they are uh, guilty. So you can now raise your hand and maybe share your thoughts or ideas about this advertising, um, which is incorrect and should be improved in order to use the advertisement in reality. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much. That was a great, uh, Ms. Linta. Uh, that Thank was you. a great presentation. And uh, I'm greeting everybody. One of the problems you have these days is the AI advertisement. For example, you find uh, one of the uh, international uh, businessmen uh, advertising that, for example, you pay $250, and then in one month, you will get $1,000. and uh, uh, these are well personalities in business. How do you encounter this? I, but my problem is I don't know. I cannot differentiate if this person is speaking uh, a real person or AI. But my children know it very well, and they say, "Dad, this is AI." For example. Yes, I, mean, I, I know what you are like, saying. Like Bill Gates, like for example, uh, uh, this is a this is a big problem, really. Because many people can't it appreciate if it's, if it's, you know, false or if it's, it's real. It is very misleading. If the person is created by AI, it should be mentioned. But unfortunately, it's very difficult, especially because technology is improving very fast. It will be more difficult in the future as well to check if the person is real or created by AI. So if it's misleading, you can reach out to the company who is publishing the images or videos, because if it's not a real person, you should be informed. But I, I hear what you are saying, and it is difficult with the AI technology to uh, check and verify if it's real people speaking or maybe an AI created person. In some occasions, you can actually see very clear it's created by AI because you can see the lips are moving in a different way or the eyes or the voice which is not matching with the person moving. Uh, but that is a problem indeed. We should also be happy with technology. On the other hand, because of technology, we are uh, we have more access to different sources of information. And I is, think this that- These are disastrous. This is a disastrous technology, in fact. I mean, a lot of people think it's real and then they pay money and then when they end up for- for, for yes. Hands. I mean, this is this is very bad, really. If it's created for a incorrect purpose, it is very bad. If it's created, for example, for people who are lonely and they can speak with someone, it can be for a very positive engagement effect. It depends on the purpose of the technology, device, or product or service you're selling. If it's negative or positive, and I think every consumer should be very aware 
of the product you are buying and check the review of the company or maybe the name of the company and previous charges against the company to have more background information before you get involved. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for joining, Skadia. So do you maybe have an idea of the misleading uh, problems with the advertisement you can see in the screen right now? I can see two participants raise their hands. I do not see who for some reason. Uh, so I see Herbert and Sakaria. So I think Sakaria, we just spoke with you. Um, if you have another topic, please unmute yourself. If not, then Herbert, can you please unmute yourself and share your thoughts with us? Okay, I've uh, unmuted. Thank you for the opportunity. From my observation in the advertisement, like looking at the point number four, yeah. five out of six seasonal allergic sufferers are Greeks. Five out of six. What always causes the uh, be, be the cause of their allergy? It has not been stated. That is one. And yeah. the the, the uh, product composition, that is the material used in forming the product, is not listed. So that in case some of the people that may be allergic to it can know that this uh, this very uh, 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 this very component will affect me or not. They have not stated it, so it will expose the consumer to risk. Yes, that is true. It's uh, not very transparent the way it's measured, and also um, it can help to control asthma symptoms. But we do not know which allergy symptoms are involved here. And a very important aspect actually of this picture is the fact there is a child on the picture because it's misleading as the girl is under the age of 18 years old and the product is actually meant for people above the age of 18 years and older. And also uh, the claims must be supported by data from well-designed studies, not, not just five out of six. Because you as a consumer, you may not know the study or what results they show in reality. So if the FDA determines that claims are not supported, it will take action and have the advertisements corrected. And in reality, if you do have any doubts with the advertisement, you have the right to ask for more detailed information from the company. So anyone else has any ID? What else could you do to check if the product is? If the product is real. So another factor you could maybe think of is to speak with your healthcare provider if it's about a healthcare product. And also check the results of the uh, tests or maybe the uh, studies, if they use any study or if there are more studies to back up the results of a product, if it's related to health, for example. Does anyone else still have something to add to the advertisement? But I think a very important aspect is also there is no brief summary about the product which should be included in an advertisement. We can only see a few statements, but that's it. So Antonella, can you maybe uh, move to the next sheet, please? We have a question from Kennedy. Let's see if he has, wants to, to answer your question. Okay, please. Yeah, uh, I'm trying to good afternoon, everybody. It's afternoon. I'm calling you from Zambia. Keep it out. 
Uh, what, what I've observed is that most of the times the pharmaceuticals have got a problem, maybe they uh, produce products which are for export only, which makes uh, other countries receiving such product to be suspicious to say why is it that uh, this product is just for export and cannot be used in their own country. So such uh, uh, issues, you find that uh, and uh, most of the times such drugs uh, or pharmaceutical products are taken back to the country where they were, they are withdrawn from the country which has uh, bought those products. So what did you say about the, such uh, adverts? And you know, pharmaceuticals are products which uh, we rely on for treatment, and we find that maybe some people have consumed even those uh, uh, medicines, and it leaves a very big impact whether the people have consumed that such medicines or yes. uh, pharmaceutical products. It leaves a very big question mark. So, what did you say about such uh, things which normally happens in the pharmaceutical area? on misleading products and uh, yes thank you thank you good afternoon first of all to you and thank you for participating uh, i think you mentioned a very important industry and i think one of the most difficult industries for us to check upon uh, because the pharmaceutical industry is a very major industry and a lot of money is involved in the industry as well and different products if a product is only meant for export and it doesn't reach the consumers in the jurisdiction, it could be because of different factors. It could be, first of all, because the ingredients of the product are not approved by the national authorities and they are by countries abroad. Another factor you can consider is that maybe there are contracts already signed with the company who is selling the products and they can only, for example, sell 10% within the country and 90% must be exported. So there are different uh, factors that could determine whether products are only meant for exports or if they are approved for sales in the Netherlands or in um, Ghana or maybe any other jurisdiction. So for example, if you check the nasal sprays, there are different types of nasal sprays and the rules in the Netherlands are quite strict. You cannot just sell any nasal spray because it can also harm your natural uh, way the body works, for example. So the pharmaceutic industry, they have different types of rules per jurisdiction and per country. And that will also influence the import and exports. I see we only have one more minute and I do need to leave uh, at the end of the presentation, but I want to thank you all for participating. And if you have more questions, then you can send the question to me per email, which I will share in the chat with you. And I hope today's lecture gave you a valuable insight about false advertising and about your rights as a consumer and what you can do and what you can do without uh, starting a legal case, but also to do the background research of a product. I have time for one more question and then uh, we have to end your presentation, but you can still send me the question for email. And also I uh, included in the presentation, guys, if you're interested, a book about so more information about false advertising and uh, never forget if it's too good to be true, the products you are willing to buy may too good to be true in reality. So use your reasonable knowledge and skills and experience before you're going to make any purchase, especially if it's a very big amount. You